Uh, yep, we're going here. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Bougie Bakes and we'll be taking a look at ballerina Teresa Farrell and why she counts calories to prepare for her ballet season. This was a highly requested video ever since I posted my review of Scout Fourth Sight's video, which you can watch right here, since ultimately the two dancers could not be more different in their approach to food. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, Bougie Bakes. So now that the world is finally starting to open up a bit, I'm really trying to enjoy the summer and try entertaining outside as much as I can. So I'm having friends over for brunch at least once a week now. And you guys know me, I have zero qualms about indulging in full sugar, full gluten, full dairy, and all the things. But most of the families that I host have at least one or two different dietary restrictions. So I tend to have to kind of get creative, especially when it comes to dessert. So I'm always so grateful when I can find something sweet that I don't have to make from scratch that is ultimately a really safe bet for all of my friends, regardless of their dietary goals. So these sweets are from Bougie Bakes. All of their desserts are completely gluten-free, dairy-free, and sugar-free for the folks watching blood sugars, and they also have a wide variety of vegan options too. Naturally, this means that I like to serve mine with like a lot of full fat, full sugar, full dairy ice cream. But again, I'm all about choice. I'm also not somebody who would knowingly choose like a sugar-free cookie, like ever, but they are actually really good. So I don't feel like I'm giving my friends and family something that I wouldn't want to eat myself. They also deliver fresh to your door, so it's really just one less thing on your plate. And I like that they use these great 100% recyclable and reusable packages in all their orders. So if you wanna learn more, you can check out my link in the description and use my promo code ABBY20 to get 20% off of your order. Also, you can pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a huge trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating, as I will, of course, be talking a lot about numbers and calories. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on an episode. So in this video, Teresa gives us a behind the scenes look at how she prepares for her season with the American Contemporary Ballet in Los Angeles by working towards a goal to lose weight. Now, in order to get there, she's attempting to drop about a half a pound a week through pretty precise calorie counting. Now, since I'm not a sports dietitian myself, I reached out to some of my colleagues, two of which actually work full-time with ballerinas. So I want to say a huge thank you to Heidi Skolnick, Yassi Ansari, Chelsea Cross, and Ali Kugler for weighing in and giving me some great insight through their clinical experience. And on that note, let's take a look at what this ballerina eats in a day. So I am 115 and a half pounds, and I feel I dance my strongest at 114 pounds because I think I've heard this with cyclists, you, you want as much lean muscle as you can so you can propel up the hill as quickly as possible. So first of all, I wanna approach this sensitively and with kindness because while a lot of us may see a woman like Teresa and scoff at her desire to lose weight, it's important to note that these unattainable standards are very much rooted in the culture of dance. Research actually suggests that female ballet dancers tend to have the lowest body weight when compared to other forms of dancers, which also speaks to why there's such a high prevalence of disordered eating among ballet dancers in the pursuit of thinness. Now, I'm not about to make any assumptions about Teresa, but I did just want to be empathetic here because there is a lot of internal pressure and expectation around physique in the dance culture itself. As for her goal to lose weight, I think it's important for me to just point out that I do believe strongly in body autonomy and that ultimately you've got the right to want to change your body. But if she were my client, I would want to really be discussing some of the potential risks of further weight loss when there are some clear risks associated with that goal, which I'm gonna to speak to more in a bit. As you know, I hate 
BMI, and we also know that it's not the best indicator of health, especially for folks in the overweight category. But we do have evidence that being severely underweight does appear to increase the risk of all-cause mortality, even more so than with severe obesity. So at 115.5 pounds, Teresa is already considered underweight at a BMI of 18.1, and losing that precious pound and a half will put her at a BMI of 17.9. This may feel good to her and where she dances her best, but it's generally not the direction that we would want to head towards for improved health, and I'd be trying to really unpack and explore that experience with her in more detail if she was my client. Now again, this is nuanced and these BMI goals are really just averages and not particularly great ones. So the bigger question for me would be around body fat percentage to sustain hormonal function. Now, obviously I'm not Teresa's doctor. I don't know anything about her hormonal health, but I will just warn that most folks need to maintain a body fat percentage of around 22% to maintain regular menstrual cycles. And most women don't see abs until they are well under the 20% body fat mark. Hence why getting super lean or like a six pack isn't necessarily the most healthy, sustainable goal. I also wanna point out that with any weight loss, there is a big risk of losing metabolic muscle mass, which it sounds like is not something that Teresa would want. But anyways, I wanna get into looking at the food. So let's take a look what she has for breakfast. I've been training to get back to my performance weight. I am going to eat a pre-breakfast. So I like to have a corn dog first thing in the morning. These are actually really delicious and really filling. And I don't think it's actually that unhealthy that I'll eat while I do my stretches. So I get these stuffed peppers with turkey and rice. And so that's 240 for one of them. Alrighty, so Teresa starts her day off with a corn dog as her pre-breakfast, followed by what looks like a frozen dinner of stuffed peppers with some turkey and rice. I mean, this obviously doesn't read as a typical breakfast meal, but I also guess it's kind of refreshing to not see like a smoothie bowl or avocado toast as usual. Now the key here for something like a rehearsal day would be to make sure we're fueling up with some good carbs and some protein to help sustain practice. And it does sound like that's what Teresa's goal is as well. So in this case, we have carbs, fat, and protein in the turkey and rice stuffed pepper and corn dog and a little bit of veggie action from the peppers as well. Now this is a higher sodium meal, but in terms of a meal for you know pre-rehearsal, as unconventional as it might be, it's not a bad choice. I would probably wanna see a little more carbs here to really get her through a really long rehearsal day, but that could really be as easy and convenient as just adding in one or two pieces of fruit. Other fast and convenient options might be to do like an egg and cheese wrap with a bowl of fruit, or a solid bowl of oatmeal with some raisins, fruit, and a couple hard boiled eggs. I do, however, want to comment on Teresa's suggestion that she didn't think these corn dogs were that unhealthy. And I mean, ultimately, I agree. I appreciate that Teresa isn't demonizing food here, even a food that most of the wellness community would probably get their panties in a bunch over and call out as toxic, cancer-causing junk. The terms healthy and in contrast unhealthy are so subjective. And it would seem to me that Teresa's definition of healthy and unhealthy is rooted almost exclusively in its caloric content. So let's talk about it from that perspective. One of these Trader Joe's turkey corn dogs has just 150 calories, which is ultimately less than like an apple with a tablespoon of peanut butter on top. Now, if we look at the nutrition label, we'll see it has about six grams of protein and only 1.5 grams of saturated fat. So yeah, nothing really to freak out about in my books. Now it is higher in preservatives like sodium and supplies over a quarter of her sodium needs for the day, which potentially might feel a little bit bloating when you know, you're confined to a leotard all day. And that number is likely to more than double when we factor in the other frozen meal that she has. Now the corn dog is also a source of naturally derived nitrates, which may or may not be any less likely to contribute to cancer risk than synthetic nitrates. But do I think that this makes this corn dog inherently unhealthy? No, not at all. 
No. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. No. It's got carbs, it's got protein, and while this might not be the highest quality source of these nutrients, especially in comparison to, let's say, that apple and peanut butter combo, it's ultimately fine in moderation if this is what feels good to Teresa. I think this is a cutie. Those little oranges. Maybe it's a clementine. No, I usually have oranges on my break. I love oranges myself, but we're looking at like 35 calories per piece of fruit. So considering the intensity of Teresa's workout, I would probably recommend trying to get in more carbs, more calories, and again, trying to keep it light and low in fiber to prevent any digestive distress mid-rehearsal. So a fruit-based smoothie with some dates, banana, maybe a bit of yogurt in there, might be a more sustaining option for a morning snack. And I actually noticed later on in this clip that she is having a little bit of some kind of pre-made smoothie. So yeah, that's a good option too. Now, my colleagues also pointed out that getting in enough hydration is often a challenge for dancers just because of the annoyance of having to get in and out of a leotard multiple times a day. Anyone who has ever worn like a cute bodysuit to the bar knows this dilemma well, which is why I personally mastered the side pull and pee. But anyways, this would be a really good time to focus in on getting in some of those fluids. So ideally about a cup of water every 20 to 30 minutes or so. And I actually noticed that I think she's drinking like a sugar-free Gatorade here, which I mean, given the intensity of her workout may make sense to get in those extra electrolytes as well. A woman my size just to maintain on a normal day is roughly 1850 calories. So to lose half a pound a week, I do a 250 calorie deficit a day, which has me consuming 1,604 calories a day. So I'll be there in three weeks. I'm sorry, where are these numbers coming from? Even if we were to assume that the average five foot seven woman needs 1,850 calories to sustain her weight, that would not account for the insane amount of intense physical activity required of a professional ballerina. Ballerinas need to be eating enough not only to support their health, but also their rigorous training regimen. So 850 calories at baseline is very likely not enough here. A professional ballerina Teresa's size is more likely to need somewhere between 2,500 to 5,000 calories a day, depending on the intensity of their training. And this speaks to why it's so important to consult with a sports dietitian for an accurate assessment of your unique energy needs to promote optimal performance. Honestly, there is no such calorie counting app or online calculator that can accurately determine what you actually need to help support your health and your training. Having said that, you know what else is kind of annoying? Have you noticed people are saying, Having said that, after everything they say now, yes, having yes. said that, yes. let me say this. Right, right. If we put aside my professional stance on Teresa's goal to lose weight, which is probably that it's not in the best interest of her health, I guess I'll give the girl props for aiming for a relatively realistic weight loss goal. So many people set these lofty three to five pound a week goals when research suggests that slow and steady always wins the race. And the smaller you are to start with, the more conservative you'll want to be to help preserve that metabolic muscle mass and metabolism. Again, I am not supporting or condoning her weight loss goals specifically. I'm just saying that for the general population, slower, smaller weight loss goals are obviously more likely to actually be met. So what I do is I will just remember what I ate all day and then at night, I have this little notebook that I put it all into. So we had the three clementines. We're estimating that at 70. I have half of a smoothie. Okay, so I am glad to see that we got a little smoothie action in there with her snack. That's definitely gonna make that orange snack a lot more satiating. But, you know, there's definitely room to have the whole smoothie in this scenario. Oftentimes people seem to not like the idea of counting calories, but for me it's so much easier because otherwise you're always wondering or you're thinking I should have seen a result by now. But if it's just the math, then you just know what's happening and you don't have to wonder. But do you have to wonder? Like, do you actually know what you're eating? Okay, hear me out. 
I appreciate that for some folks, calorie counting just works. Whether you need a greater sense of control, you wanna be able to eat a wider variety of foods without worrying they're gonna put you over some caloric allowance, or you just really like math, for some people, calorie counting isn't very triggering. But you can't tell me it's not consuming. Weighing out and recording every bite you take feels like such a huge mental burden to me. And when you're getting down to minute details like this, is it really precisely accurate? No, not really. First of all, how does Teresa know exactly what her caloric needs actually are? Because she might be able to get a super rough guide from an online calculator, but as we already mentioned, that number does not take into consideration intense individual variation related to muscle mass, physical conditioning levels, metabolism, past dieting history, gut microbiome, and so much more. Her needs are also going to fluctuate every single day. So for one, there's a lot of assumptions being made about her needs. Then we're having to put a lot of trust in the calorie counts that she's actually recording. So in the case of something like an apple or really any whole food, it's important to note that the number you see in MyFitnessPal is just an average. It's not hard, absolute data. And as for processed food products, note that food manufacturers can legally be off by 20% on their nutrition labels. That's the difference between logging 1600 calories and over 1900 calories. In other words, it's potentially enough to derail one's weight loss goals. And we cannot forget about human error especially when making estimations from combined meals or recipes. Research actually suggests that people underestimate their true caloric intake on average by approximately 30%. So you can see why calorie counting to this degree may be a futile and highly inaccurate endeavor, especially when you're starting with such a narrow caloric window for error. You know, depending on how much I danced will influence a lot how hungry I am. Since I work out so much, I'll eat over 2,000 calories, but it'll still bring me in the 1,600 range. So, so far today, I've eaten 1,225 in calories, and so I'm going to put in my exercise, because that's going to subtract even more off of that for when I figure out how much I can eat. Okay, lots to unpack here. So according to my colleagues who actually work with ballerinas, one of the major challenges in this population is that the high intensity training can actually mask hunger, which is why what may be a better approach in this population is to really aim to eat balanced meals every three to four hours and focus mainly on optimal pre and post training nutrition. Attempting to calculate how many calories exactly were burned in a training session and then plugging it in as if it makes for like a black and white mathematical equation is wildly inaccurate. Not to mention, it's also strange to hear her even mention how hungry she is when she then just goes on to determine the size of her dinner based on what she ate that day, how many hours she danced, and the respective calorie counts associated with those activities. There's just a lot of mixed messages going on. So that means I burned 804 calories. So at that point, my caloric intake will be 1985. Mine is the 804 in exercise, that's 1181. So I'll probably have a big bowl of cereal, which is around 300 calories which is two ounces and 200 calories. And I'll just weigh it, because this is one of those things that skim milk is 90 calories. Okay, well, I guess in terms of balance, this is probably Teresa's best meal of the day. And that is, of course, very important as a post-workout recovery meal. So in terms of nutrition, at least, we've got you know protein in the chicken piccata, lots of veggies in the salad, and some carbs in the cereal that she has for dessert. But it's important to note that the serving size on like the package of cereal should not be treated as a recommendation of what you should consume. Rather, the serving sizes are actually supposed to reflect what the average person would typically consume. But honestly, some food manufacturers try to kind of fudge this to make their nutrition facts look more favorable than what they really are in real life. They're getting better, but they're still not always great. Case in point, nonstick cooking spray, which has a serving size of a quarter of a second spray, which is not accurate in my opinion. 
So serving sizes should therefore not be interpreted as a recommendation or a one size fits all because we all have different needs and appetites that fluctuate day to day or even on an hourly basis. So yeah, I love math too, but a quick and dirty calculation. He's adding back the coefficient. He has a value for P. He's plugging that back in. He takes the derivative and he solves the equation. We'll never replace our body's innate wisdom, even if the numbers do seem to add up. I eat prepackaged food because I don't have much time. It's really easy to know what's in it and I'm not a very good cook. I mean, with all due respect, I would argue that it's easier to know what's in your food when you make it from whole food ingredients yourself. Now, I have no issues with enjoying a frozen dinner or a prepackaged salad or a bowl of cereal for dinner even. Like, we're all busy and honestly, if leaning on some convenience food staples helps you nourish your body with the calories it needs, amazing. I ultimately think that that is a good intuitive choice for self-care. So the time convenience piece, I totally get. But choosing packaged foods because you know what's in it, AKA you have easy access to the numbers on it, feels restrictive to me. It tells me that Teresa is limiting her options to those that she has external data on because she's forgotten how to access internal data like her hunger and fullness cues. This is definitely an area that I would recommend Teresa works on with like a trained dietitian so that she can make more varied choices without compromising on convenience or her performance. I think that people often assume that ballerinas are maybe hungry and they don't realize that with exercising so much that you can actually eat a lot of food if you choose healthy things. Yes, I would agree that that is the perception, you know, that ballerinas don't eat a lot of food. And while I would say Teresa's day does look a little more plentiful than let's say our friend Scout Foresight's, it's still not actually a lot of food. One thing perhaps of note about my diet is that I do eat from all the food groups. You're not, you're not limited. I'll go out to a restaurant and, and be able to easily choose. I'm not confined to needing to bring something along all the time. So I am happy to hear that Teresa is able to go out to a restaurant. And I guess this is the benefit of like a, if it fits your macros or calorie counting approach to weight loss. You know, if you don't mind the enormous mental load that comes with logging every food you eat and figuring out how many calories you have left at the end of the day for like dinner or dessert, the benefit I guess is that in some cases, you have a bit more flexibility on the types of food you are allowed to eat. I guess it's different strokes for different folks. You know, like all diets ultimately come down to some form of restriction. And it just depends on if you want to restrict like the quantity versus the quality of the foods, or in some cases, both. So after hiking for about an hour and a half, then, uh, then I'll have an orange and then I'll maybe go and pick up a salad. Okay, so this seems to be like from a different day. Interview is kind of all over the place. But anyways, I would say like an orange and a low carb, low calorie salad would not be the best choice in post-workout fuel for cardio like a hike like that. I would definitely want to see like a solid meal with a combination of carbs to replenish glycogen stores, protein for muscle recovery, and some fiber and fat for satiety. So for example, like a good sized sandwich with some choice of protein in there and maybe some salad on the side would make for a more appropriate post hike meal. This is what I would eat on a day that I go for a two hour hike and do two hours of stretching. This brings me to a total of 2,275 calories. And so, and I've exercised just under 700 calories. So if I eat like this and exercise like this, I'll lose a half a pound a week. It's a lot more food than people expect. I eat a lot of vegetables and chicken and steak, fruit, high fiber. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how little the internet thinks that women need to eat. Like I was shocked that in my latest What I Eat In A Day video, that I got a ton of comments in awe at my appetite. When I'm over here thinking that like, that was actually kind of a light day for me. So please, 
Repeat after me, folks. You need more than a toddler amount of food to live your best life. I mean, I guess it might look like a lot of food to some people when it's all laid out like that because a lot of it, like she mentioned, is high fiber, high volume, low calorie foods like greens and other veg. However, when we think about the general macronutrient recommendations for dance athletes, they actually require a higher percentage of calories from carbohydrates in order to support their increased energy levels needed for training. Oftentimes, my dietitian colleagues will use the plate method as a meal planning tool to help athletes map out their meals to ensure that they're actually eating enough fuel. And in the case of moderate to hard training, we would want carbohydrates to make up between a third and a half of your whole plate. And that makes sense considering that dancers train for hours and therefore need sustained energy from those carbs. So it might feel like she needs to eat a high volume of foods to meet her caloric needs because she's mostly eating and relying on those low calorie veggies and lean protein in her day. But we would be able to get greater energy nutrient bang for our buck if we had some more carbs in there, like some more whole grains and starchy veggies. So this is a tablespoon. So one of these with olive oil is 120 calories. So if you saw that steak I put on the scale, that was 133 calories. And if you also think to lose half a pound a week, you only have to cut out 250 calories, you basically have to just cut out two spoonfuls of olive oil. Well, she seems like a fun dinner guest. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of like food fat phobic discussion going on. I noticed it also when she was using skim milk when, I don't know, in my opinion, a higher fat milk is always going to be a more satiating, satisfying choice. But anyways, Teresa is of course correct in saying that oils are calorically dense compared to a lot of other foods in the diet. So when you're in a caloric deficit, I'm not denying that we'd want to make kind of smart decisions about added oils and fats in our diet in favor of other higher fiber, higher volume foods that contain far fewer calories. But when our diet gets down to minute numbers like this, we really miss out on the very important enjoyment factor that helps us feel emotionally satisfied from our meal. And if you're not satisfied, you're always going to be fighting with yourself for more. Now, fat is also more physically satiating as well, and is also important for promoting better nutrient absorption from fat-soluble vitamins in things like a salad. So my take-home message for everyone, even those who are trying to lose weight, is not to fear fat. A little dressing or cooking oil can absolutely be worked into any diet, even if you are in a caloric deficit to try to lose weight. People often joke about how much more I eat than they expect when I'll go out to dinner because I'll get a big piece of fish and a big plate of vegetables and I just won't eat a lot of olive oil and bread and that sort of thing. Maybe someone who knows very little about nutrition might think it's a lot, but when I just see like a plain big piece of fish and a big plate of vegetables with no carbs or fat, my diet food alarms go off. So yeah, I know I'm a professional, but She's not fooling me. So really, I think that the, the key is figuring out how to not be hungry. And that's actually what the counting helps me do. When I'll, I'll talk to a friend that's on some new diet or something and it becomes such a big part of your focus where this, I feel like can just run in the background. So this is really, really interesting. And again, I think it really comes down to like different things working for different people, but Remembering and physically writing down every single thing you eat every single day doesn't seem to just run in the background on its own. It does seem to be a significant commitment physically and mentally. And whether or not she feels consumed by it, I mean, is personal. But I disagree that there isn't a focus on it. It's literally a math activity that she's having to do multiple times a day. I mean, she has made it clear that she's a very busy girl and writing down everything she eats physically eats up time. Personally, I would way rather use that time 
to make one homemade batch prepped meal for the week, or I don't know, like literally any other act of self-care if cooking is not like an enjoyable task. This interview is just getting weirder. If, if you're not getting the nutrition you need, uh, you can't keep up with the mental and physical demands of, of ballet. Well, yeah, I mean, we definitely agree on that. And it's no question that underfueling combined with rigorous exercise or training can lead to serious health consequences, which go way beyond not being able to keep up with the demands of the sport. In fact, overtraining and underfueling commonly increases the risk of what we know of as the female athlete triad, AKA increased risk of low energy availability or intake with or without disordered eating, impaired bone health, which can increase the risk of fractures and reproductive suppression like menstrual irregularity. Not to mention underfueling can also lead to nutrient deficiencies, mood changes, soft tissue damage, slow recovery, weakness, and mental impairment, which I can imagine would make things like intricate choreography a bit of a challenge. So to Teresa's point, getting enough fuel in the tank is essential for both physical and mental health. And again, that means ensuring that we're getting enough fuel to support basic energy needs and our training regimen. So all that said, what can we say about Teresa's diet? Well, I appreciate that we're not seeing a ton of the typical diety foods here. Like it's definitely refreshing to not start the day with lemon water, celery juice, and avocado toast like everybody else on YouTube. But on the flip side, we are seeing pretty much an exclusive reliance on highly processed foods, many of which are microwaved from the freezer and therefore high in preservatives and salt. And based on our rough calculations, Teresa is getting about twice of the recommended daily salt, which is probably not a huge deal considering her electrolyte needs are higher than the average person. It also looks like her calcium, iron, and fiber intake is a little bit lower than what we would wanna see. And since both female athlete triad and iron deficiency are commonly found in female athletes, we would definitely want to be consistent in getting enough. As for macros, she's getting roughly 21% of her calories from protein, 38% of her calories from fat, and 41% of her calories from carbs. And while even with this reduced calorie intake, her carb intake would still be too low for this sport. But if we actually were to consider that these percentages are based on an already hugely suppressed caloric intake, we can see that she needs more, a lot more, of basically everything across the board. She just needs ultimately more food. So for some nutrition tips, we do wanna be super gentle in this population, especially since she has likely been underfed all of her adult life. So it would be really important to go slow and focus on increasing those carbs at meals and snacks to slowly increase her daily caloric intake without triggering her to pull back harder and restrict. We would also want to focus on nutrition timing here. So this might look like eating a balanced meal three to four hours before training, an energizing pre-dance snack one to two hours before dancing, a small high carb snack during breaks to maintain energy levels, and then eating a post-workout recovery meal with a combination of protein, carbs, and fat to help replenish energy stores and repair muscle for the following day. I would also personally wanna consider the quality of her diet and not just quantity when it comes to nourishment. And relying on numbers alone can't really speak so much to that. So for a professional dancer, we would definitely wanna see a greater emphasis on meals rich in higher fiber carbs to support energy needs, protein to support muscle recovery, as well as those healthy fats to reduce inflammation using what we call that dancer's plate that we already discussed. So bumping up the carbs in her rehearsal snacks will be a really easy way to deliver some much needed energy and help her meet her daily fiber needs, which we already discussed were a little bit low. Lastly, it's also really important to stay hydrated, which as I mentioned, can be a bit challenging on some of those long rehearsal days. However, rather than drinking a huge amount of water in one go, my colleague suggested drinking smaller, more frequent amounts of water throughout 
before and also after rehearsal. So this might look like drinking two to three cups of water before rehearsal and one cup every 20 minutes during. Finally, what can we say about Teresa's relationship with food? Well, this is a tricky one. I will say that it was refreshing to not hear a ton of moralizing language about food. The girl eats corn dogs, microwavable meals, and other convenience foods. She doesn't restrict dairy, sugar, or salt, and she doesn't label foods as inherently good or bad. She also doesn't seem to moralize herself around her body size or weight. It all seemed very removed, like, as if her body is her machine and the food is just the fuel to make it move and look a certain way. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's not something that I would want personally for my relationship with food or my body, but I do think it is the default mentality for a lot of athletes when it comes to food. However, like I've mentioned, calorie counting comes with its limitations, which is definitely apparent in this case as it doesn't take into consideration the nutritional quality and satisfaction factor from food. Rather, strictly counting calories reduces food to a strict arbitrary numbers game, and that can ultimately make it really easy to override your body's cues and true needs. This does seem to be the case with Teresa, as we're seeing that despite meeting her alleged caloric requirement, she still isn't getting enough carbs or micronutrients. And if we were to do a more accurate appraisal of her needs, we would see that she needs a lot more calories and therefore even more carbs, protein, and fat to make up said calories. But I do know that the dancer's view of their energy needs are statistically more skewed than in other professions. So I think it is fair to meet this dancer where she is and focus more on shifting those macros for optimal pre and post-workout fuel. Ideally though, I would love to see Teresa move away from strict calorie counting and instead attempt a combination of some meal planning tools and internal data. Just some food for thought. And on that note, that is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you again to Bougie Bakes for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on who you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.